the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Um, we have apologies from Jamie Halcrow Johnson, who's unable to be with us today. Um, and in his place, we have John Scott, MSP. Um, I think everybody will be happy enough with that. Not happy enough, they'll be perfectly pleased with that. <laughs> and, um, okay, can we first of all decide, please, to, as agenda item one, to take um, agenda item six in private. That's for the committee to consider a draft report and draft standing order rule changes. And do members agree to take that in private? Thank you very much. Agenda item two, then, um, and in cross-party groups. Agenda item two is for the committee to consider an application for recognition for a proposed cross-party group on the USA. And Dean Lockhart, MSP, is the uh, proposed convener of this group. And uh, welcome, Dean. Thank you, uh, Dean Lockhart, MSP. Um, would you like to make a short opening statement on the purpose of the cross-party group in the USA, please? Yes, uh, good morning, convener, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear before the committee this morning. I think the proposed cross-party group on the US could make a, a number of important contributions uh, across the areas of trade, foreign investment, education, and cultural exchange. In terms of trade, the US is already Scotland's largest export partner uh, internationally and accounts for around £5 billion of trade uh, each year, £5 billion billion pounds of exports, which is roughly 18% of Scotland's international uh, exports. And both the Scottish Government and the UK Government are looking to promote trade with uh, the US. So the cross-party group, group could uh, play an important role in uh, uh, promoting collaboration between the key stakeholders in terms of trade between uh, both countries. In terms of education, uh, thousands of students come from the US each year to Scottish universities and colleges, and there are a number of exchange programmes between between the countries which are increasing and research, uh, research collaboration is increasing between the countries as well and I would hope the cross-party group could encourage uh, those trends in the future. Uh, in terms of cultural activity, there is uh, a huge Scottish diaspora in the US and there's already significant cultural exchanges between the countries and I believe the cross-party group could uh, enhance that further. Uh, the uh, US Principal Officer Ellen uh, Wong recently uh, took up post in Edinburgh about six or eight months ago and part of the reason why this proposal is uh, coming to the committee now is uh, as a result of a number of discussions with the US pr uh, Principal Officer who's very keen that uh, 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 she uh, increases her engagement with the Scottish Parliament. Uh, if the uh, cross-party group is uh, uh, um, recommended, the Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce have agreed to act as the Secretariat. So I believe there's a lot of support uh, for the cross-party group to be established and to further the aims I have just mentioned. Okay, thank you. Um, so I would like to invite uh, committee members to ask any questions. Uh, Mr Lockhart, is that fine by you? Okay, Elaine first, please. Thanks very much, convener, and thanks for joining us. Um, and apologies for my voice, as you can hear, I'm struggling a wee bit. Um, it does seem to me that a, a lot of the purpose, when, when we look at it and from what you said, just involves exchanges, although you did mention um, issues around trade. So could you maybe expand that? So that seems quite limited. So could you maybe expand a wee bit more on what, kind of, you know, how often you think the group would meet, what, what other topics might be discussed, and also um, the organisations involved. Are there any sort of um, Scottish-American organisations? You know how in America, obviously, there's um, the, the, the Scottish organisations that are there, going blank on the names of them, but is there any organisations like that in Scotland that you think might want to join the cross-party group as well to widen out the organisations that you have interested? Yeah. No, absolutely. It, the, I've spoken to a number of organisations and it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. They've expressed real interest in joining the group once it, it is officially established. For example, the Carnegie Institute uh, based in Dunfermline, I've spoken to them, a, a number of universities I've spoken to uh, are very interested in joining and the, the, the way we've left it with them is if and when the group is established, they will come on board and uh, take, take forward the work in those areas. In terms of 
the aims of the group, I, I, I think there's a lot of interest in having trade missions uh, to the US, not just looking at the US as, as a federal state, but looking at individual states in the, in the US in terms of increasing um, connections, business connections, but it, it, cultural and education connections with uh, specific states in, in the US. And I believe the cross-party group can act as a, a platform uh, it won't have execution capability, as you know, in terms of limited resource, but it can act as a platform to uh, share information and bring together people who are interested across the areas of trade, education, cult cultural exchange. But in terms of, sorry, convene if I come back in, sort of in terms of the remits of cross party groups, it, it would be more about informing members. And I'm just interested in the kind of. Um, guests that you might have along and the, and the topics beyond exchanges, if, if you've thought further than that? Yeah, sure. The I met with the principal officer last week uh, at, at the US consulate, and she has a number of ideas. Well, I don't want to necessarily go into detail here, but she ha has a number of ideas as to how the parliament can get involved with the cross-party group. And she has, uh, as recently uh, in her post, she has a number of ideas as to how she can promote uh, engagement with the Parliament, uh, with US companies. The US is one of the largest single investors in Scotland, and there are a number of companies uh, she mentioned to me who would want to get involved with the cross-party group uh, to expand business links, but also to have a better understanding uh, for Parliament to understand better, Scottish Parliament to understand better what actually is happening between the USA and Scotland. And sorry, convene again, right, come in. And would she join your cross party group? She's not listed at the moment. But, uh, but absolutely. She, she, she uh, was one of the uh, inspirations behind the idea of the cross party group. So she would be a central uh, figure in, in the cross party group. OK, thanks, convener. Okay, thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, Tom Mason, please. Yeah, just a really clarification, Dean. Um, does, does the US not have a consular general in, in Edinburgh anymore? Yes, they, they, they call it the principal officer. So yeah, that, that, she that's is effective as a site. Correct, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, why, is she, why is she not actually joining the group as a permanent member? Uh, she, she will. Um, oh, again, right. she, okay. she was waiting for it to be established before uh, formally joining the group. Okay. And can you clarify for me the, the, the other individuals, what their sort of reason for being there? Yeah, I, I think uh, a number of uh, members. Uh, you, sorry, you're referring to MSPs or well, uh, it was um, Julia McIntyre, Thomas Harold, and William Sterling. Oh, they, they are. Uh, some of them are members of my office. Uh, <laughs> Will, William Sterling has a significant history in the U.S. and uh, he's Scottish, but he spent time in the U.S. Okay. and he wants to he wants to look at the trade aspects of uh, the the links between the countries. Uh, as I said, there will be a number of other members, institutions, organisations who will join once the group is officially established. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, John Scott, please. Um, thank you, um, convener. Um, good morning, uh, Mr. Locker. Can I ask you about the opportunities of um, the cultural links in, in between the Scotland and the American diaspora and the benefits of enhancing those? Perhaps here in Scotland? Absolutely. I, I was surprised when I looked at the number of uh, events that take place. It's relatively limited. And we have uh, Tartan Day uh, in April, which I think is the, the showcase between cultural exchange between Scotland and, and the US. Uh, given the huge Scottish diaspora across the U US, I, I think there is an opportunity to increase uh, cultural exchanges. And that's something I did discuss with um, the, the principal officer, Ellen Wong, at the US, and we've got a number of ideas as to how we can engage with organisations who are already involved in cultural exchange between Scotland and the US and encourage further uh, promotion in that area. John? Maureen Watt first and then Mark Rusko, please. Um, yes, I'm not sure the job of cross-party groups is uh, to promote uh, trade between countries. I thought it was more kind of um, cultural issues and stuff like that. Can I just go through the individuals in the li listed here? How many of these four are working in your office? A, uh, Leslie, Julia and Thomas are listed primarily as people who will help uh, run the cross-party group in terms of just admin. And but in, in terms of individuals, I have the, probably the, the form should have listed more individuals, but I can assure you there are a number of people who will uh, be involved in the, in the cross-party group if it is established. 
And in terms of the universities, do the students have student organisations um, that are, that, you know, university student organisations? And can you name them in Edinburgh and Stirling University? Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. I met with someone from Edinburgh University yesterday to, to discuss this, and they have a number of ideas as to how they can involve uh, student groups at the university in, in the cross-party group. So that's very much something we will be taking forward. But there are currently no student organisations related to the, uh, to the United States? Um, there, there, there are. There are, but they, they haven't engaged yet with the cross-party group because I thought it was a bit premature to reach out for engagement before the cross-party group was established. So what what are the names of the, the organisations at I, Edinburgh University? I, 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 don't, I don't know the individual ones. I, I could have listed St Andrews as well because I've, I've spoken to, to St Andrews University. There's a huge number of American students in St Andrews and that would be something I would, once the group is established, I'd look to uh, reach out and engage with them. I mean, clearly the place in Scotland with the most, or historically the most people from the United States, is the North East and the oil and gas industry. There's nothing about that here. Uh, that's true, and, and again, that's something we can work on once the, the group is established. As I said, the Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce have agreed, if the group is established, to act as the Secretariat. Um, they have a number of uh, planned uh, trade activities um, as part of the Scottish Government's um, a ambition to increase trade with the US. So the Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce will, uh, I, I believe, uh, add a powerful voice to the cross-party group in terms of not just trade but business links. And I, t I agree the role of a cross-party group is not to increase trade, but I believe part of it can be to increase business connections. And I think um, increasing business connections is all about collaboration, it's about sharing ideas, and it's about uh, increasing the network of people who are engaged in, in increasing links between the US and Scotland. And I think that, that, that applies also to education, it applies to cultural activities. Uh, I, I very much see the cross-party group as a, as a platform to enhance interaction between Parliament, between MSPs, and between stakeholders who are involved in the Scotland-America relationship. Maureen, sir. Okay, thanks. Right, thank you very much, Maureen. Mark Ruskell, please. Um, I appreciate what what you're telling us, um, Dean, in relation to you know it's a bit chicken and egg in terms of you know you set up a cross party group and then you know individuals and organisations will come on board. But I, I'm a bit surprised about you know the initial individuals that are listed here, most of which are, are members of your your staffing team. Can you, can you furnish this committee with letters, notes of interest from the US consulate, from the other organizations that you've listed, specifically saying that they are interested in joining this group and what contribution that they would bring to this group? Um, because you talked about the potential, but I, I, don't see, I, I don't see a firm number of groups that are, that are coming together, uh, wanting to work together, wanting to work with you and other MSPs to really further the agenda of understanding of the opportunities that the engagement with the US presents. Um, you know, so it, it, the case looks a little weak at the moment, and I, I'm just, want, just wondering how you can convince us and bring forward evidence that this will be quite a robust and useful cross-party group. No, I'd, I'd, I'd um, happily do that. J just to give you a parallel, I set up... Well, do you, sorry, do you have that now, though? Do you have, can, you, can you provide those letters and emails and notes of interest and firm commitments to join and be part of this group? I can't now do that now. I, right, didn't, okay. I didn't know that was a formal requirement uh, as part of the cross-party group uh, application, but I can, I can get those very easily to you. Mm -hmm. And to provide a, a reassurance, you probably remember five, six months ago, I was here to set up the cross-party group on, on Japan, and I probably had a similar um, number of individuals involved. In the first meeting of that group, we had 35 uh, people at that group, and we've now got a, a large number of organizations involved in that group. So I, I, I saw this cross-party group on the US as following a similar pattern. And I, I, but if, if you would like the, that paperwork, I'm, I can happily uh, 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 submit it to the committee. I think, uh, personally, I would I'd find that would be a reassurance mm. um, as to the direction of the group and, and, and its remit, really. Um, I'm just going to ask about linkages with other groups. So is there an all-party group at Westminster on US that focuses on trade and other issues? There's not actually. I think historically there was, but for whatever reason there is not one in this current term of, of at Westminster as I understand it. Okay. 
I mean, that that would be a, a natural place for trade issues to be to be discussed. Yeah, would it not? Um, and it can also ask about um, linkages with other cross-party groups. I mean, you'll be aware of a burgeoning burgeoning number of cross-party yeah. groups. Um, you know, in many ways, a victim of their own success in some mm. ways in this parliament. But there is now, you know, moves to seek greater collaboration between groups. Joint yeah. meetings, I think, have been very successful. The ones yeah. that I have attended. So where, where would you see the, the, the kind of shared agendas between cross-party groups? I think with uh, other cross-party groups that focus on education, I think there's definitely an uh, opportunity for, to collaborate and have joint meetings. So if we were having a specific, if, if the group is established and we were looking at education, for example, we would definitely engage with other cross-party groups that are, inv are involved in education. Likewise, if it's um, going to be a session on business development or trading links, there are other other groups that we can could involve um, to make sure we're not, you know, doubling up and using resources for two separate meetings. That we make sure we use parliamentary time in the most efficient manner possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I declare an interest as a co-convener cross party group on food, but food policy, for example, yeah. and trade is that something well, that may be considered. The cross party group in Scotch whisky or food and drink would mm -hmm. be the ideal um, example. So, for example, the US is the biggest market for uh, Scotch whisky exports uh, and for food and drink exports. So if we were having a session on the US cross-party group on exports or on food and drink, there would be two or three other cross-party groups that we could naturally get involved in that meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, just a small question from Tom Mason again. Please. Yes. Uh, I just wondered if you... Uh, the uh, US is a, is a big country. Oh. Big, big, you know, area to cover. Do you anticipate concentrating on particular states or just a or, 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 uh, very broad brush um, attack, as it were? It, it's a very good question. I, I think it would be a combination of uh, engagement with federal um, organisations. But if Scotland was, in terms of Scot Scotland's economy, was ranked alongside US states, we would be the 25th uh, state in the US in terms of economic size. So it gives you a fair idea of how th th how big the Scottish economy is with regard to a comparison with individual US states. So we, we are bang in the middle of the, the average economic uh, size. This is GDP per capita. Um, so I think we would, there's a, a number of, I would say five or six states that already have strong links with uh, Scotland. We would look to uh, build on those links, but also uh, look to develop new links with other states. Okay, Tom, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for those replies, uh, Dean Lockhart. Um, I'm getting a bit of a, a feeling um, from questions that the idea um, of a cross-party group in the United States is one which people believe could be advantageous. Um, however, there is, I believe, also um, f from a number of our uh, members on the committee a feeling that further information on those areas which have been inquired about um, may be something which, if it could be provided, would give us greater comfort on the establishment of the cross-party group. And um, could we uh, possibly send you a, a small note to ask on those areas? I don't expect you to remember them all. Um, and that, therefore, uh, you could reply to us and we could bring you back at some point in the not too distant future to, to go over those again in order to give us um, a feeling that a cross-party group in the USA is a good idea to establish. Yeah, I'd be very happy to, to uh, proceed on that basis. Is that okay? Right, okay. I think that's fine. And um, right, I'd like to thank you for attendance. Uh, the committee uh, will at the moment consider whether to approve the application for recognition and we'll inform you of that decision. But as I say, you may look out for, for us to be in contact with you also. That's great. Thank you. Okay. And thank you very much, thank Mr Lockhart. Thank you. Okay. So, um, does that seem reasonable and fair to everyone on the committee? Uh, John. Yes. Um, yeah, I, 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 think it, it, I think it's fair. I think it's um, a bit of overkill. Um, in my experience, um, we've... We've set up cross-party groups before, and a lot less um, evidence being required from them. I think um, it's an outward-looking group. Mm -hmm. I think it's a fact, and has been since the beginning of the Parliament, that 
Tartan Day is the, is the one thing oh. that this Parliament goes out of its way to support. Yep. I'm actually surprised that we haven't had a cross-party group in America before. On reflection, uh, I know Elaine has been to Tartan Day and uh, would want to encourage these cultural links. Uh -huh. um, I'm, I'm actually surprised at her antipathy, apparently, towards this. So I do think it's a very positive thing that uh, Dean Locker is bringing forward, and I would propose that it should be approved. OK, thank you. Um, Elaine Smith first and then Tom Mason, please. Thank Thanks, you. convener. I don't have any antipathy towards the cross-party group on the USA, but I do think that for some of the questions we were asking, um, maybe the answers weren't readily available, and therefore, given that this committee does have to take a decision, then I would actually suggest not that we're going to refuse the cross-party group, but I think it would make sense to send the note to get those answers and so therefore just to put off the decision until that is done and that might just be a couple of weeks but I'm certainly not turning my face against a cross party group in the USA John's quite correct, I did attend Tartan Week and that's why I asked about the um, societies I wondered whether the kind of societies that are in the US, whether those kind of societies here as well who might be interested in the cross party group so I would just be suggesting waiting till we get the further information, putting off the decision. Um, I think that would be the wise thing to do. Okay, thank you very much. And Tom Mason, please. Okay. Yes, I, 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 I was quite surprised we don't have one already uh, in, in position. But uh, it's, it's, the evidence we've got here is uh, as much evidence we had as other groups we've passed, in, it's in, in my limited experience. So I, 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 and, and if we agree we're going to pass it anyway, going through additional hurdles seems to be unnecessary. Um, just to have the comfort blanket added is not going to necessarily cha change the decision. Okay. Um, right. Well, I'm, I'm working. Pu oh, sorry, Mark. Yes. Um, I, I think it's important that cross-party groups are, you know, established in a in a very thorough way, and you know, I, I see strong evidence that on on the whole that they are. But I think you know there are questions around the initial membership of this group. Um, I mean, clearly, Mr. Lockett has uh, has gone to some trouble to to reach out to some organisations. But I would I would have I would have liked to have seen a you know a letter from the U.S. consulate or you know substantial reassurance from other organisations like Carnegie Trust and the various universities that they're going to participate and and also that the student bodies will be involved as well. So um, I, I don't think that would be particularly onerous for yeah. Mr. Lockett to secure those. Um, but yeah, it just means that we defer consideration for a, another few weeks until he, he provides the, the correct evidence, really. Yeah. Right, well, it's not for us to run um, the cross-party group, especially not before it's even established anyway, but at the same time, if um, the general mood, and I do understand what has been suggested by John Scott in particular and by Tom Mason, um, that you know this is a group um, which we almost definitely would be in favour of, um, but that if we can gain further uh, information on how it will be established um, and who will be members of it, uh, would actually we do have 106 cross-party groups already, um, and we have talked before about being more rational about the numbers that we have of them. If we can ensure their viability before it actually comes into being, I think that would do no harm. John? i just say on, on that point, um, Bill, that um, I think... It's important not to limit new groups simply because there are um, and there are many already set up. <laughs> Declaring an interest, I set up farmers markets a long time ago, and we had I knew at the outset that there would be many would endeavour to, but not all would succeed, and therefore the best farmers markets were the ones that continued and prospered. In the same way, cross-party groups, I think it's. There should be all should be encouraged and brought forward, um, and that the best ones will succeed, and that the ones that fall by the wayside will fall by the wayside because either there's a lack of interest or they're not sufficiently well managed. But I don't think it should be a condition of the standards committee. I'm not wishing to be presumptuous that we should set. To stop other new cross-party groups being set up simply because there are already over 100. No, that's fair enough. Um, uh, uh, and in actual fact, um, without spinning this out too long, because we do have other business, but but 
Um, I believe, as I said, that um, there's a general mood that this is actually quite a good idea as a cross-party group, but that we as um, a group committee members uh, in majority, if we may put it that way, um, would m like to see further information in order uh, that we are satisfied that this cross-party group will be successful in its um, existence. That's basically it. Okay, does that seem reasonable? Because we don't want... Oh, sorry, Maureen. Sorry. No, I just want to say, <coughs> you know, it's very central belt focused and given, as I say, that there's a, a large American population in the northeast, mm -hmm. I would have thought it might have reached out a bit further than central belt. Okay, and Mark. Can I yeah. Just ask for clarification then, convener. Um, what, what would be the time scale for deferring a decision on, on this matter? Okay, thank you. Look, um, I think we've, uh, this is agenda item three, and um, we've got a general, um, a general opinion or direction, um, and we would like to um, bring Mr Lockhart back with further information, and this has been recorded, um, and we will follow up um, and hopefully get uh, Dean Lockhart back in the not too distant future uh, with the further information um, to be provided, which will include geographical areas. Um, and hopefully from there, uh, it will go on to be one of our successful cross-party groups. If that's okay. Thank you very much, everyone. And agenda item four, um, it's for the committee to consider and agree our annual report. Um, now, the annual report has been circulated. And uh, does anyone have any comments at all, please? Yes. Yes, yes sorry, um, Maureen Watt, please. Okay. Uh, can I just say on page two, introduction, it's got membership changes, but it hasn't actually got the current membership on it. Just on the other, on the rec committee that we looked at this week, it says they also the current membership. Uh, right, OK, thanks very much, Maureen. Uh, my advice is that this will appear at the start of the report, um, so it will be included, yes. And thank you very much. And Mark, please. Um, I may be missed it, convener, but I didn't see a breakdown of the gender balance of witnesses that were giving evidence um, to the committee, and I wondered if that would be a helpful inclusion, given that it's something which I think all the committees in the Parliament are currently reporting on. Mm -hmm. I think that's perfectly reasonable, and uh, we will... I think it's been... Okay, can we um, can we look into that and come back to you, Mark? Mm -hmm. Then uh, we I think there's there is a general direction, but I think that it's something that maybe shouldn't be discussed at the moment in public uh, because it is an area of um, the committee's business which we will have to consider first. Um, but it certainly seems it's something which will be looked into if that mm -hmm. seems reasonable. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, of course, yeah, Celine Thank Smith. Um, it's under the Commission on Parliamentary reform section on portfolio and general questions and I just wondered whether we need any kind of explanation as to why we agreed that the number of questions drawn for each portfolio would be reduced from 10 to 8 perhaps um, because it's my recollection that that was so that it was a more realistic number and would allow more engagement through um, supplementary questions uh, and, and my slight concern is, in practice, I think I probably have to go back and look at how how it's working, obviously, on the back of our report. But I think um, it, it wasn't about getting the eight questions in every single session, every single week, but it was about encouraging more um, engagement in supplementaries, if I'm correct. Okay. We could add something. Yes, yeah. we can have that added also, if that's reasonable. And I think it is, actually, yes, I um, so what we're really looking at is for... Oh, sorry, big pardon, John. Yes. On that subject that Elaine has raised, I noted yesterday that there were only five questions in the second set of portfolio questions. There were three, eight questions, but three weren't lodged, which reduced the whole number to five, which is always my fear about this, reducing um, the number from ten down to eight. And I, I think... If, I'm well aware I'm only a substitute here, yeah. I hope, for one day. But um, I, I think it's something that maybe you might want to keep under review because there's a, a very real 
risk of not having enough questions. Um, just make the point. No, I think, and, and thank you very much, uh, John. I think that's important, in particular, given your previous experience as a, a DPO. And <coughs> pardon me. I think it is very important that we do uh, keep uh, these type of chain, potential changes and changes under review. And I think that that's something um, which is beneficial for us to take forward in consideration. Um, we will want to bring uh, certain elements, as has been brought forward here, uh, back for um, for the committee to have a look, further look at. Um, John, uh, Tom, big bang. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 certainly with, with the questions not being lodged, it does help the, with every question being asked, which having been on the number nine and number ten twice now and missed out, um, one gets really agitated that there's too many questions being pushed in. Yeah. And you sit there see, hoping that people will sit down. Well, okay. Been in that situation, and I'm sure we all have as well. Um, I think um, that that's that's worth consideration as well. And I do think the circumstances of not lodged questions is something which may need to be looked further into, also as to reasons as to why that might be the case. You know, so it seems unfair when someone has actually got a particular question which they really would like to be asked in public, and they don't get the opportunity. Actually. Uh, 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 Chairman, a fine in the, in the charity box might be a good idea. <laughs> Maybe we won't go down that route, but thank you anyway. Uh, right, OK, so, um, yeah, are we content with the report, with those provisos um, which we have brought forward? Great. That seems reasonable, thank you. And that will be report, uh, report will be published because we will have a look at these elements that have been raised. The report will be published on the 21st of May. All right, and I'd like to thank everyone for that. Um, OK, agenda item five. And uh, the next uh, agenda item five is for the committee to consider um, correspondence that has been received from Mike Rumble's MSP, who has joined us today, and also from Adam Tompkins' MSP, regarding law officers answering questions in the chamber. Now... Uh, the committee is being asked to consider this correspondence previously at our meeting on the 28th of February and agreed to write to the Scottish Government to seek uh, their views on the points raised. Um, just before we go in, to, and I'd, um, I think I believe that people will be comfortable with this, before we go on to inviting any comments, uh, may we ask Mike Rumble's MSP if he would like to make a, a relatively short statement, please, because we do have a lot of business. Um, and, uh, but I think it's only fair if uh, Mike Rumbles gets an opportunity to do so. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Convener. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak to you about my request that a recommendation be made to Parliament to update paragraph 1371 on standing orders. Standing orders are the oil which helps the machinery of Parliament work. And I know this from being a member of the Bureau uh, for, for two parliamentary sessions. So just as background, after the Lord Advocate made a statement to Parliament in February last year, and took 14 questions from MSPs on matters not related to his role as the head of the prosecution service. I waited 11 months, I interested the question about uh, questions, 11 months before I won a place on the ballot to ask an oral question, a portfolio questions entitled Justice and the Law Officers. Imagine my surprise and disappointment when the Lord Advocate didn't answer my question but remained seated in the chamber. Or could I say, imagine if you had asked a question of the health minister only to have it answered by the Minister for Parliament while the Health Minister looked on. So this situation has exercised my mind for nearly four months. So I'd like to refer to the letter you've received from the Minister for Parliamentary Business. I'd like to comment on it. Firstly, he says the flexibility offered in Rule 1371 allows for instances when a law officer may not be available to attend proceedings in the chamber. And I couldn't agree more with this absolutely relaxed about this. That's what the signing order is designed to do if the minister, in this case, the Lord Advocate, uh, couldn't make it. But in fact, he was sitting in the chamber listening to what I had to say. He then goes on to say, there is no procedural impediment to the Lord Advocate or the Solicitor General as ministers, because that's what they are, uh, responding to oral questions. In fact, the Scotland Act makes, and our standing orders make it absolutely clear they are to be treated in the same way as other Scottish ministers. So I couldn't agree me more with, with that response in the letter as well. That is how it used to be operated until January. 
But that is not how it operates since January. Another point, the minister writes at length in his letter to you about the law officer's legal advice to the government. But that wasn't what my question was about. I had no intention of asking uh, what the law advocate's advice was to the government. I didn't. If I had, I would have expected an answer. So that's not what I was asking about. And I told the Lord Advocate that subsequently. So in his conclusion, having, having gone off on a tangent about legal advice, that was, you know, which I didn't ask about, so in his conclusion he states that he believes standing orders are fit for purpose. So my specific request of the committee is that you consider recommending the updating of paragraphs 13, 7, 1. And the example I have, I hope, you, I hope you've got the 13, 7, 1 in front of you, in 1371, it already says at the very last sentence, and it refers to the First Minister in this case, an oral question selected for answer at First Minister's question time shall normally be answered by the First Minister, but may, if the First Minister is unable to attend the First Minister's question time or any part of it, be answered by another member of the Scottish Government. How reasonable. That's how we've operated, that's how we should operate. So I would like to make a suggestion and put it on the record, if I may, going to the second, replace the second sentence in paragraph 13.7.1. So take that second sentence out, which starts an oral question, and replace it with an oral question concerning the responsibilities of the Lord Advocate or the Solicitor General for Scotland should normally be answered by them, but may, in exception, may exceptionally be answered by another member of the Scottish Government if they are unable to attend the chamber. Now, to me, I'm not making any political point at all because we can leave political points for the Chamber. What I'm trying to do is make sure that we as MSPs have the right opportunity and response to be able to question ministers in the government. That is our role. Um, and therefore, our standing orders should reflect that. Our standing orders up till now, certainly up until January, have been sufficient when the government has recognised that. Although the minister in his letter says there's no impediment to asking the, for the, the Lord Advocate or the Solicitor General to answer those questions, the government chose not to ask them to answer the questions. Our job as MSPs, I would have thought, was to make sure that we have standing orders that are fit for purpose, because to make it clear what we intend, that if an MSP asks a question of a Lord Advocate or the Solicitor General in their responsibility, that he or she would expect an answer from them, in the same way as you ask any other minister. And if they can't be there, perfectly acceptable. On this particular instance, this wouldn't have been an issue because if, if the Lord Advocate, if I hadn't seen the Lord Advocate sitting in the chamber, if the Lord Advocate hadn't been there, I would have assumed, probably wrongly in this case, that he was busy elsewhere and that's fair enough if another minister answers. But that wasn't what happened, and I don't want that to have set a precedent for us in the future. So our standing orders in this particular case, in my view, are not fit for purpose, and we need to change them. Okay, I thank Mike Rumble's MSP for his contribution there. Thank you very much. And I would like to invite comments from members, if there are any. Elaine hey, Smith, please. Thanks, convener, um, and thanks to Mike Rumble's for joining us. Can I ask, actually, it's not a comment, but it's a question. So if we look at Rule 13.7 and the, the second part, the second question, uh, second sentence that, that you were talking about, an oral question concerning the operation of the systems of criminal prosecution and investigation of deaths in Scotland. So are you saying that that's too limited? Was your question beyond that and actually... Um, Therefore, is it a question of who decides what the Lord Advocate's remit is? The, the Lord Advocate's remit is, is that currently, as it's mentioned in, in standing orders now in that second paragraph, but in addition, he uh, there's a lot of issues which he he's the head of the prosecution service, so that's why that's in. And until February of last year, that's all... And I've been here for, when I started 20 years ago, as, as, as you have, but in my case, with an intermission... Um, and over those 20 years, that's how the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General have operated. But it changed in February last year, and that's why I think we need to update our standing orders. It changed in February last year when the government put forward the Lord Advocate 
to make a statement to Parliament and 14 MSPs asked questions of the Lord Advocate on his remit, which is not the prosecution service. And therefore, I thought it was absolutely perfectly proper. And my question was accepted by the, uh, by the chamber desk because I waited for the, to be selected for the ballot. I asked the oral question, perfectly acceptable, and the government decides, well, the government, not parliament, the government decides that the Lord Advocate shouldn't answer that question. And that's why I think it, it has changed. What the Lord Advocate has done has changed. In his letter to me, he said it was unprecedented that he changed it, but he's, he's now set the precedent, or the government has set the precedent, because what it now means is, at any time, the government can decide if to put the, to put the Lord Advocate in front of us if they, want to t if they want to take questions. But we should be holding the government, that's part of our role, all the MSPs who aren't members of the government, it's our job, whether we're in opposition or not, to hold the government to account. And the government is, and they are part of the government. So there has been a change in the system from February last year, which are not reflected in, our, in this paragraph and standing orders. So what I'm doing with my suggestion, and it is only a suggestion, if the committee decide with the clerks they want to go away and suggest something else, I would be happy with that as long as it addressed the issue. It makes the, the, the remit clear that um, the, the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General should be able to answer questions on their remit. And Elaine, do you want to follow that up at all? Well, just to the extent, convener, that um, I think the, the, the issue, if there is an issue, lies in that sentence um, because if a question isn't on, that, that's what standing orders say at the moment, and therefore if a question isn't on those two areas, then it seems to me that the government, it would be reasonable for them to decide who answers it. But if, it has, if the remit has changed, then I think we need to look into that a bit further before we make any decision on this today. OK, thank you very much. And John Scott, please. Um, well, thank you, uh, convener. Well, um, I agree with um, Mike Rumbles and, and Adam Tompkins, and I think they raise a, a valid concern. It's been, I mean, I think up to the point that the, the protocol or, or the standing orders were, were breached, um, or the precedent was breached, um, with uh, the, the, the EU Legal Continuity Bill, um, I, I don't think that the government can have it both ways. Um, and so... Mr. Rumbles suggests a different form of words for the second sentence in the Standing Orders Rule 13.7, oral questions in the, fame, in the chamber. I, I didn't actually catch the form of words or write down the form of words that Mr. Rumbles suggests, but I do, I'm sure he will have a copy of it. Um, but I do think that there might be an opportunity for the committee, for the, for the, the committee clerks, for the lawyers of the parliament um, to, to consider um, his, his form of words and, and, and perhaps improve on them, even um, bearing in mind, I think, the very real point that he has raised, and which I um, find myself supportive of. Thank you, John Scott. Um, Tom Mason, please. Yeah. Yes, point of order first from Gil Patterson. The general debate at the present time, or are we still reflecting questions to Mike Rumbles? Well, was Mike Rumble's uh, going to participate in this debate? Now, well, um, Mr Rumble had made his statement, so we are now in debate. making our discussion. OK, here. thanks very much. Well, OK, is that all right? I get a chance. Thank okay. you very much. And Tom Mason, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think Mr Rumble has raised a point that certainly needs this detailed discussion and, and study. Um, as always, it's all to do in the detail and the small print to get it right, but I think we must spend some sufficient time looking at the, what's, what's, what the issue has been raised, come to a conclusion at some point. Okay. Thank you. And Mark Rusko, please. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got some sympathy here um, with the point that, that Mike's raising. Um, and I think particularly Lane's point about whether the remit has changed is, is worth looking at in, in a bit more detail. But I, I think it, it could be dangerous for us to write into standing orders exactly who should answer which question. Um, I mean, I, I, would, I would give you the opposite example, Mike. There, there are sometimes I ask questions of particular cabinet secretaries and I actually wish another cabinet secretary was answering that question. And in a way, 
this is an issue about collective cabinet responsibility. It is an issue about joined up governments. So there will be times when, particularly with cross portfolio issues, where I, I'd like to see greater engagement from other cabinet secretaries as well. Um, so I know this is specifically about the Lord Advocate, but I think there's a wider issue here about you know pinning into standing orders which bit of the government needs to answer which thing when you know. So I appreciate the frustration that you had at the time with asking your questions and that's very palpable but um i'm not not convinced at the moment but i'd I pick up lane's point looking at the remit okay. if the remit has changed and that would be so, sorry point of order yes if this is a debate with an external member that's not right fine okay sorry but um, this is, but no, I'm afraid, Mr. Rumbles, we have to. This is within the committee, and we will be coming back to yourself on the basis of that. But we can't have a, a cross uh, argument here. No, it's okay because I, I mean I understand you, so I think it's okay. okay. Don't, don't be concerned at the moment. Um, yep, uh, Maureen, uh, please. So, okay, so um, what we don't have here, unfortunately, and I should have probably looked at it myself, is the answer to the question. Was Mr. Rumbles unsatisfied with the answer to the question? Well, my question, you're just uh, putting a foot. No, you well, can't. Well, because this, is this is it. Is you know, this is where we're. Either we should be asking questions and then having a debate, or and finishing the questions and Mr. Rumbles leaves, or we discuss it. We're this all over the place. Well, here this today. is in public, and it's an opportunity for people to make their point of view. At the moment, we will be following up further on this. But at the moment, people, on the basis of what has been presented by Mr. Rumbles, we can have uh, a bit of discussion about. But it's it's not something which is open for uh, for Mr. Rumbles to take part in. It's it's members uh, making their contributions at the moment. Okay. So, regardless of who answered the question, the answer would have probably been the same. What is at stake here is um, the probing of legal advice to the Scottish Government, which uh, normally remains confidential to the Scottish Government. And to me, that is the question about this. And also, uh, what other members have already raised is about what the Lord Advocate is there in standing orders to answer. Okay. Right. Now, is anyone else? Sorry, uh, Gil Patterson, please. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Congener. There's a number of issues uh, at stake here. And it's the power of a government to govern it is one of the prim primary ones. So it's for the government. If you ask a question to the government, it's for the government to decide who will answer that question. And it doesn't say at First Minister's question time <coughs> that the First Minister must. It says normally. That doesn't mean to say must. So there's no imperative uh, in that regard. It may well be, uh, though I don't take it as read, that some precedent has been set. Uh, it might have been allowed by the chair, the presiding officer, to go ahead, but he should have ruled if it was not within the scope of uh, uh, any individual MS, a, a minister of a government to make a response. Then it's at that point uh, that that should have been corrected. So the fact that, that it may have happened doesn't mean that we need to change our standing orders. And there must be protection, and there, it's, it's uh, almost a, a president that a government would divulge what legal advice that it had sought and received. And if a question inadvertently is aimed at uh, eliciting that information, then I think it's within the go any government, uh, any government. A government must be allowed, and ministers must, and uh, cabinet secretaries must be allowed to seek legal, legal advice, and they do so almost on a daily basis. And those who have been ministers will know that. Okay. So the idea that they are not protected in uh, refusing that legal advice, which they may well do, and it becomes a political issue, must be an, an imperative that's protected. However, having said all that, and I hear what my colleagues are saying in regards to looking at the, uh, what has been presented, 
on the issue of a president, I'm happy to look at it. Well, why not? It's democracy. Let's look at it and see what we can come up with. But there's principles at stake here that we shouldn't shift from. So if, if you think that you want to change it because it's advantageous at the minute, you have no ambition to be the next government. So this is about protecting the future of this parliament and governments to have the right to govern, to make change, to listen to advice and reject it. Not accept it, but to be in a position uh, without uh, any compromise to that, to reject that legal advice. Right. Um, Elaine Smith, please. Thanks, convener. Uh, yeah, I agree with a, a lot of what um, Gil has said, but Mr Dumbles did say in his statement that it wasn't actually about legal advice. Um, I think he felt that, I think he actually said that was something of a red herring in the reply we got from the government. So I think for us, the question is whether or not um, we want to look a bit further at the, the standing order, because the standing order 13.7 specifically talks about the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General. Um, it talks about other ministers and it talks about the First Minister, but it specifically talks about the Lord Advocate and Solicitor General. And for me, I think what we need to look at, as I said at the beginning, is whether or not the only questions they should be answering are on the operation of the systems of criminal prosecution and investigation of deaths. Has the remit changed? And if so, does this stand in order need updated to reflect that? And what it says is she'll normally be answered by the Lord Advocate or Solicitor General, but may exceptionally be answered by another member of the Scottish Government. Now, if it were to be exceptionally answered by another member of the Scottish Government, which I think is something that must stay, and presumably the Scottish Government um, would be able to justify the exceptional nature of the Scottish Government answering the question, rather, or another member of the Government answering the question rather than the Lord Advocate, I think the question arises then... Um, and that, and that wouldn't have been an issue had the Lord Advocate not been in the chamber because I suppose we would all have presumed there were exceptional circumstances and we wouldn't have wanted to delve into that in case those were personal circumstances as well. However, it arises because the Lord Advocate was in the chamber. So to me, I think what we need to do is have a better look at, or a closer look at the remit. Is it, is it just the systems of criminal prosecution and investigation of deaths? Or is it wider? And if it is now wider, then perhaps that sentence just needs to be tweaked to reflect that. Okay, thank you. Um, no, I, thank you. Yes, John Scott. Uh, thank you. I, I would agree with that. I think there's a, a piece of work to be done here. It may be that parliamentary lawyers, having looked at it, come to the view that there isn't a change to be made, but I think it's a very valid point that Mr Rumbles and Mr Tompkins have raised and therefore it's worth it of having a look at, and if there's a recommendation to be made and brought forward to this committee, then they will then be able to evaluate that advice at that time. Tom Mason, do yeah, you agree? Thank you. Um, Mark Ruskell, do you agree? agree? You agree as well, sir. OK, right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, didn't want to get us into a long, uh, twisting discussion and argument. Um, it's useful to have people's feelings about what's been said. It's all on record. Um, so it will be brought back to us in a further paper. We also have um, on a general catch-up evidence session next week, we have the Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans uh, coming to speak to us. And on that occasion, uh, we could um, discuss these issues further with the Minister, if that seems reasonable to everyone. OK, and um, thank you very much. If we're agreed on that basis, then that's what we will, we will continue to do. And I'd like to thank Mike Rumbles for coming along today. Members for, for listening so carefully to what I had to That's say. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. OK, that ends the public part of the meeting. Um, and we're moving into private sessions, so that allows time uh, for the public to leave, please. Thank you very much. Okay.